Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct by construction, concurrent, scalable solution, our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative of planet. Please join us on this journey. Great. Well, welcome everyone to this week's iteration of the climate and coordination our cast. Um, we're really happy to be able to keep having these um, important discussions. And um, today we have a variety of different um, topics that we are going to bring up. So it should be a nice conversation. So starting off, um, I saw this interesting piece from uh, ABC, um, but I actually wanted to critique it slightly. And um, this is a little bit of a downer, but the second piece is, is a happy story. So um, <laughs> trying to balance it out here. So this first one is from ABC News. This is from November 25th. So this is just, um, I guess, uh, a little over a week ago. It says, from wildfires to disease, here are the top five ways climate change is already hurting your health. So this is something I think is really important for people, especially in the Western world, to understand. Is like um, people, a lot of people sort of feel that the climate crisis is not really affecting them in any way, um, any material way. And that basically, uh, you know, um, so long as we can secure water, you know, and food, Basically, uh, you know, we're not going to be affected by this as much as some other places in the world and um, especially in the southern hemisphere. But that's actually not really true. Uh, the first way that climate change already affects people is through heat related illness and heat related illness is becoming much more common, um, especially in the last, you know, I would say two decades. The next thing they list is infectious disease. Of course, people know that um, uh, diseases that are carried by insects that used to be in different parts of the world, hotter parts of the world now are moving north and it's sort of shifting around because they need to have certain uh, conditions to survive. It says here, uh, some infectious diseases that were already present in North America, like Lyme disease and others, um, Obviously, those have already uh, existed for a long time, but they are much more common now than they were before, especially in North America. The next thing they list here is uh, extreme weather events. And they say, it's so interesting, they say here, um, extreme weather events have indirect health impacts by creating refugee areas. That's true, but this is a big criticism I have is that, and I'll explain this with another piece, um, another source, extreme weather events actually um, are not just an indirect uh, health impact to people and the people who survive uh, these extreme weather events, which are only becoming more frequent and more severe. The, those people are really the lucky people. Um, so I, I thought that was a bit funny that they said it's indirect <laughs> if you don't die from a fire or a horrible hurricane. Uh, of course, the next one, which I think is really important, is air quality. Air quality um, is extremely bad, uh, especially during fire season especially in the western part of the United States for long parts of the year. 
um, and especially people who already have asthma, who already have other conditions. Mm. There was a discussion about people who had COVID uh, being um, subjected to dangerous air quality and how that combination was not healthy at all. Um, all of these things are uh, very dangerous. Uh, air quality, I think, has become a big um, topic within the last decade or so, especially because asthma is so common among children now. And the final thing they list here is mental health. And I think it's really important to talk about, we've talked about this before, but mental health is, um, I'm so glad they mentioned it here because, um, you know, there is definitely a, a climate anxiety. People talk about sort of extinction grief. There are all these different types of sort of, um, you know, ailments that people are really suffering. And instead of thinking that, oh, these people are ultra sensitive, I think that really it's more that people who suffer from those types of mental health problems are, they're really realizing what's going on. You know, if you're not mourning the, <laughs> the you know, destabilization of your home planet and its climate, then I don't know, you know, what would cause that so that was the five things that were listed on abc but just to follow up i did a little research um so i looked up the report from the world health organization from february 2018 uh this is a report called climate change and health and there's a ton of information in here um but i wanted to just point out here that it says in the key facts right at the top, between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. So 2030 is um, basically nine years away. <laughs> it's not very far away. Um, you know, it's basically the same distance to now is 2011 so it's very close and um <clears throat> i just think it's funny that that abc piece said indirect uh it can harm you indirectly if you survive a natural disaster yeah but there are a lot of people who die in natural disasters too um so that's what i wanted to say just at the outset but i have a, a little bit sunshiny piece but first i'll pause and see if anybody has any comments on this. Yes, I had a comment. Oh, so, great. Um, uh, and I, I am sharing, indeed I am sharing my screen. Um, and the comment was it, to do with something it said in, in, in the piece that, that you sent, the ABC piece, um, about COVID-19 potentially being a consequence of climate change. And it's something that I've said on a call before that, that, that my take on COVID-19 is that it's Gaia's way of reminding us that we're breaking our contract with this planet. Um, and if we continue to break our contract with the planet, then you know, we won't be any humans on Earth. Gaia will still be here, but we won't be. Um, and so I've always sort of thought, well, I'm sure there is a link. It's, you, know, you can look at that linkage um, in, in so many different ways. And I've been doing some work um, on um, looking at maybe doing a COVID-19 passport that would capture um, information about um, people that are vaccinated, tested and so on. Um, but it would be self-sovereign in that the, the, the subject would own the data and control the data. And yet it would be safe, secure. All the things a blockchain like our chain can give. And at scale with no, um, no nation states claiming ownership of such a thing. And I was thinking, you know, wouldn't that be a great thing? And, and we're kind of building such a thing right now. And we're looking to um, talk to the relevant bodies, including the WHO, uh, about doing this for real and seeing where we could go with it. And then after a call earlier today, it was the China call, I was on the China call, and I was fiddling about with a, a script for, for the demo for our COVID-19 passport, literally a script to shoot a three minute video. Um, and as I was looking at the passport, it suddenly dawned on me, somewhat randomly, um, 
wouldn't it be great if we could have, I'm going to change screen, this passport, the eco passport. And the purpose of the eco passport, it's exactly, exactly the same technology as we're looking at doing for the COVID-19 passport. It's just rebranded with the planet Earth and different words. And it's a, a, a kind of a app on your phone connected to the blockchain and your identity, your data vault. And you could go around collecting um, metrics, you know, taking pictures of wildfires if you happen to see one or um, seeing a pool of water that's rancid or you know anything else that you may have. It might be um, those of those weather events, the extreme weather events that you talked about, um, but on a very localized scale. <clears throat> because part of the battle of understanding climate change, the reason why it, people are, 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 are to some extent slow to see the, that, that it really is real. I mean, most of us are convinced, right? But there are some that aren't, are less convinced. Is because it's like a huge tanker, the earth, our climate, and it changes um, slowly relative to our lifetime on the planet. But if you had more observations covering the globe, for which you would need um, uh, uh, an internet scale solution, in which we as individuals are invited to collect that data and share it, right? Which could, it could in and of, in of itself be tokenized and therefore have ascribed to it a value. Um, that value, as we collect the data and allow it to be probed by researchers um, to combat climate change and figure out what we need to do to reverse it, um, those tokens that we collect, we could keep them. Maybe if they have a value, we can sell them. Or maybe we give them to climate change in initiatives that need funding, right? So, but we, we're earning tokens to, to get the data at the same time. And so I came up with this idea of the eco passport that, that, that maybe that's a, a solution worth exploring at some point. And then um, we could then consider um, ways to bring that to market other than, of course, getting sponsorship from WHO and, and those sorts of things. And if the COVID passport works, I think this becomes actually really possible to do. Um, it, it gives us the possibility within the R chain co-op and, and all the aspirations that we have of kind of gifting this passport to the world and therefore empowering the researchers to have finer grain detail of climate change that, that connects us within our lifespan more to the changes around us. Yeah, I think it's something that we should definitely discuss more, possibly on this call or other calls, but it's a I'm so glad that you're thinking about that and that. I'll sorry. stop sharing now, but yeah. So I just wanted to share that idea because, you know, when I saw that article as well, it just seemed like a good segue because because it talks about the connection between new and novel diseases and climate change. Um, and, and then suddenly these two things kind of collide. Because if you were then capturing data about new diseases and you're capturing data about climate change, and you can share both sets of data. It's not long before researchers see very, very, very direct connections between the two. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, I wanted to actually uh, uh, throw in a, a few comments here. So oh, sure. one of the things that's interesting um, about the COVID passport is that um, it allows uh, for people to participate in um, uh, data collection about um, the e efficacy of the vaccine, for example, or reactions to the vaccine, and to do it in a voluntary way. And then because it's connected to the blockchain, it can be done in a way where they're, um, they're uh, financially incentivized. Uh, so it's, it's not just that there's a, you know, you're, you're giving up your data for, for a good cause, uh, you can give up your personal data and get remunerated in some way. And, and I think that that kind of idea can extend um, uh, to all kinds of certifications and attestations. So if people participate in a tree planting program, right, they can, they can um, add a uh, certification, I planted, you know, 1,000 trees. 
right? And there can be some authority that attests to that behavior. And then they can share their, uh, their echo behavior um, in large scale, right? So that in aggregation, we can begin to see, oh, there are this many people who are planting trees. There are this many people who have, you know, gone vegetarian, blah, 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 blah. And, and this connects to what I was saying before, which is that um, it's the gamification of behavior that is going to be the essence of this self-organization, right? We, we, need, we need to be able to find ways where people can, uh, if you think about it, like, like how, how, is the, how is the fitness movement um, bootstrapping itself? Well, a lot of it, it gamifies the behavior, right? So there's the Fitbit and, and you know, sharing your Fitbit data with others, you know, so you, you get together in groups and you, you begin to, the, the, you know, a little bit of gaming and competitiveness. Oh, well, everybody in this group has, has put in this many hours of cardi cardio. Maybe I'm, I'm now inspired and motivated to do the same. So it's that, uh, but when you have the infrastructure like the Echo Wallet um, or the COVID Wallet, it just makes it so much easier to do that and do that in a way where you don't have to trust some organization to um, uh, to to house that warehouse that data or trust some particular organization to um, give you your your fair share of um, um, sh uh, sharing up your data. Uh, so that's that's I think one of one of the big big huge advantages um, that blockchain offers and that Archain in particular offers. Yeah, yeah. And here's another extension to the, to the ideas, right? So, supposing we have our, our, our eco passport, and and we want to encourage people to to collect data and to share that data, and in doing so, they earn these tokens. But the tokens actually, they they're completely locked up. The tokens actually are a, a way of playing a lottery, right? So, the more tokens you have, then it's like the more lottery tickets you have. Um, uh, and equally as that token, as the, the lottery token comes into your digital eco passport wallet, um, a, a token that has a value that can be connected to a fiat currency is deposited, you know, and, you know, rev or, or anything that, that can be connected in that way. So something you can trade um, uh, is put into a pot. So it all goes into a pot. And every year or every quarter, there's a lottery draw. And somebody is chosen at random or 10 people are chosen at random and they receive a, a reward so it's the, the the tokens you're earning from the green doing the green stuff the good stuff you're getting these lottery tokens that you play this lottery the more you do the more chance you've got winning and then there's this engagement of waiting for the, the quarter to end and the next lottery to be played and maybe it could be you and it could be you because you've done good stuff that's a gamification that might actually have some legs. The eco lottery. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> are you going well, to go have... to the next article after that? Uh, to, to Lucinda, my favorite person on the planet. Sorry, who's your favorite? Are you going to go and planet? talk about Lucinda next? Yes, I am. That's yes, exactly, please. Yes, please. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. Um, so this is a concept that I need to understand more, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts about it. But um, this is from Reuters, December 2nd, but it was world news, I guess, <clears throat> especially in the climate space. This is the um, news that New Zealand under Jacinda Ardern has declared climate emergency and pledges to have a carbon neutral uh, government there. Uh, she's the prime minister of New Zealand, of course, and extremely strong uh, prime minister. The coronavirus response there has been, I think, by most accounts around the world, a soaring success. Um, and she seems to really care about climate and about people and about health. And um, I applaud that, but this is really interesting. So I'm trying to understand what does it mean when you declare a climate emergency? Obviously, 
um, there's a symbolic quality to it that basically you're rallying the whole government and the people, the um, the populace around this idea that yes, it's an emergency. But I think also, you know, there are some goals there. Um, it says here that um, she made this decision based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Uh, that's uh, basically a group that creates these extremely comprehensive uh, climate reports. Um, it says from one of their reports, it cited that to avoid more than 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global warming, which is what most people agree is absolutely imperative, emissions would need to fall by around 45% from 2010 levels by 2023, so that's in two years, and reach zero by 2050, and that's in 30 years. Um, but of course, people say that um, one point, some people say 1.5 is too steep of a target, so now we're looking at, you know, maybe two, but I still, there's a big um, social media campaign around the world right now, especially among the young climate activists to push for uh, 1.5 to try to keep it there. I completely agree that has to be the right thing to do because every tenth of a degree above, above that is just absolute chaos with extinctions and death and infrastructure collapsing and it's just really bad so we need to um we need to try to keep it at that level it says new zealand joins 32 other countries including japan canada france canada great job daryl uh france and britain britain great job steve <laughs> um that have declared a climate emergency so apparently 33 other countries 32 other countries 33 total have declared this type of um emergency so i'm just curious about what it actually means aside from it being a symbolic gesture i think it's a signal to the private sector that they need to get to work i think it's also a signal to legislators that this needs to be front and center and that the climate crisis is not going to be ignored by the government um which i think is a really good thing but i'm just curious what other people think about these types of declarations and well, in the in the u.s a declaration like that um unlocks yeah. certain federal funding so when the president declares a state of emergency then certain um monies become available to spend on certain things right i don't know if this is the same as that possibly it could be i'm not sure if you declare climate emergency if that's seen as like a federal emergency or not but hopefully that would be true because then that funding could go to all sorts of you know mitigation efforts and uh you know all sorts of different things that would help people mm -hmm. um you know funding to farmers who need help and uh you know tree planting efforts or uh you know conservation efforts or mm -hmm. whatever but yeah i do you know for sure if this does that I don't know. Yeah. New Zealand law. The, the, this one, I mean, the two, th two, two things I'll point out. So it, it, the, the National Party that, that voted against it talked about it as being nothing but virtue signaling. That seems to be a phrase that's often used by, tends to be a more right wing phrase used against left wing. So if people take a knee, for instance, virtue signaling is usually how it's termed by right wing people that don't really care. Um, so it's interesting here because you've got National Party voted against and say it's virtue signaling. And then when you look at, at what does it really mean? So there's a $200 million New Zealand dollar fund to finance replacing coal boilers and help purchase electric cars. OK, so the real question you've got to ask is, well, how much is that in, in practical terms? And I can tell you it's about 115 New Zealand dollars per household. That's roughly what it works out to. So it probably pays for, it might pay for half or a third or 25% of your boiler. So that has quite a significant impact because that gets rid of all the coal boilers and people only had to purchase half of it. But, it. but it doesn't purchase it outright. With hybrid vehicles, 
it's a drop in the ocean compared to the cost of a hybrid vehicle. But maybe what she'll do is use some of that money to offset road tax, right? To encourage hybrid vehicles in that way. So from a policy perspective, this one at least has teeth versus given that the UK was mentioned. So the climate change emergency that was declared here in the UK was a bill before Parliament that was um, authored by the Labour Party. That's you know, the equivalent of your Democratic Party in the States versus the Conservative Party who were in government. So that the government um, uh, allowed that to be um, voted um, through and it, it was passed, but there was no teeth. Now, in a sense, that's virtue signalling, but it's virtue signalling not by the authors. It was virtue signalling on behalf of the Conservative Party because there are no teeth to the bill that went through. There are now, as a result of it, so what it did do was open up a debate about what should targets be, and there are now real targets being put in place. But part of the driver for that is Boris Johnson will be chairing the climate um, meeting, um, I think next year or, or maybe later this month in Glasgow. And so from a UK perspective, UK government perspective, and typical of, of most governments, I guess, um, there's a lot of virtue signaling going on, but at least now because of the fact we're hosting this big meeting in Glasgow, uh, it, so it's like the Paris Accord and the Paris meeting, it's just gonna be in Glasgow this time. Um, the UK government, I think, feels the optics are right for it to make some decisions and to back it with real money. So generally what's happened when anyone's ever voted one of these through, these climate emergencies, it may not result directly in funding, but it keeps the debate live and allows the oppositions in many countries to continue to, to lobby for action, measurable action. So I think it's a good thing. Right. And, and yeah, maybe that declaration also could justify people proposing some bolder measures. You know, if people say, oh, it's too too much, it's too um, ambitious or whatever. And you could say, well, they just declared a climate emergency. So, you know, you got to pony up. But yeah, Greg, I wasn't asking about the New Zealand law. Well, I was just asking if you know if the climate declaration in America is the same as a uh, is a, a federal emergency. That's something that I, I would probably look up and maybe we can talk about it next week if I find an answer to that. But um, I, I suspect, Nora, that such a declaration is um, initially, um, unless there's measures attached to it, is just a statement and, 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 not, and with nothing binding. Uh, it's kind of like there's a climate emergency, so what? Yeah. Um, well, it was nice to see them all applauding her after she made the statement. I felt yeah. that that was a really strong statement yeah. to make. And well, and she's put out real money. So the government's there's put out real money. Right. Yeah. I don't know so how anyway, I was just really proud in... of that moment. And yeah. I'm, just, yeah, I'm totally. so happy that Jacinda uh, exists and that she governs a major nation. And it just makes me feel good. So some people are paying attention. Um, I know there is a lot more that we wanted to get to. Um, sorry about that noise. Somebody is doing some construction outside. So sorry about that. Um, so Daryl, would you like to um, present your topics? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I think my topic connects with uh, pretty much everything that's been said today. So. Uh, awesome. it, it'll be interesting to see if it kind of does because uh, to me like the idea of a declaration of a of a, a, a an emergency in in a government it, it yeah it definitely depends on you know each government and how much teeth such a declaration has but usually what it does is it like Greg says it unlocks funding and it also unlocks sometimes the military to be able to do things um, and I do believe that part of the climate change solution is going to find a repurpose for our military. Um, um, and uh, um, so, you know, it's, there's, there's lots of um, opportunities that's, that tend to open up when governments make such declarations. Um, but I also think that uh, it's another symbol or sign of um, 
of universality amongst nations, which is also something that has to get accomplished if we're going to solve climate change. Um, so, you know, when one nation can declare um, a state of emergency, they can kind of compare notes about how other nations deal with it. Um, so, it, it, it you, you know, New Zealand's now joined the club, you know, so to speak. And I think that's all really good stuff. Um, uh, so what I was going to talk about today is more of a private sector angle. Um, and uh, uh, it's I'm going to try to attempt to kind of... Um, uh, link Archain's heart to Archain's pocketbook. Um, so I think that that something happened this week in the uh, in the eco crypto sphere that um, I think um, points to the idea that we were about to enter uh, what Thomas Stalker calls uh, the fourth industrial revolution, based around decarbonization. So um, I'm just going to kind of read off some, some notes I prepared. Um, so Archain Cooperative is the legal entity that is building the Archain Layer 1 blockchain platform. Archain Cooperative is also the entity that supports the ongoing maintenance and growth of the platform as it moves through its various stages of development. We began out of the realization that the open source social network project that we were building, Scenario, required a layer one blockchain platform to build upon, and there were no layer one blockchain platforms in development that met all the requirements of Scenario. And I, I remember the days when Greg was talking about how he was dragged kicking and screaming into having to form it. You know, he, he tried, he tried reaching out to Ethereum, he tried reaching out um, and, uh, you know, came back with the conclusion that, you know, we're going to have to build it on our own. Um, so Archain, the platform, can be thought of a giant internet-based computer that can run programs. There are no restrictions about what kinds of applications um, uh, use the Archain platform. It's an open source project and anyone or any entity can write applications and run them on the platform. Uh, if I was an alien, and I wanted to build an application that would infect the minds of all humans in order to accomplish the goal of destroying the human race, I could do that on the Archain platform. Uh, like Bitcoin, you would have to shut down the entire internet to stop it. Um, as mentioned, the people who, are, who were around at Archain's origins had a purpose for constructing this scalable concurrent layer one platform. Building the functioning layer one platform is actually just the first step. This is one thing that distinguishes us from most other layer one blockchain platforms. As it states on the front page of our website, our chain is a cooperative building a blockchain platform and social coordination technologies that address the world's greatest problems. So one of these problems, arguably the biggest one, is climate change. This is a planetary problem that will require global cooperation and coordination at a level that humanity has never been confronted with. It will require new tools that the fourth industrial revolution will be built on. AI, IoT, robotics, location detection technology, advanced human machine interfaces, smart sensors, machine to machine automation, nanotechnology, 3D printing, biotechnology, VR and AR, and yes, blockchain. But what will drive the need for a rapid adoption of these tools? Swiss climate scientist Thomas Stalker believes that it's the drive towards decarbonization that will be the economic force that will propel the fourth industrial revolution. So every industrial revolution needs a, needs a, a why. Every industrial revolution kind of revolves around something that rallies people together. And... Um, and so he believes that that, uh, that thing is actually decarbonization. Um, for me, an event this week represented a major indicator that he is right. For decarbonization to be the catalyst that will drive the economic forces towards accelerated adoption of these technologies, it will have to be the driver of speculative investment mega hype it will have to become the major category in, peace, in people's investment portfolios. 
essentially what has to happen is people who don't care a bit about climate change will want to throw money at any startup that has green energy decarbonization based catchphrases scattered throughout their pitch decks. Like other speculative investment trends, it has to be the source of rabid, irrational exuberance. And like other previous speculative investment trends, most of the startups will be built around more hype than substance. We will know that this phase shift is occurring when we start to see this kind of action. Well, this week, something like that occurred. And this week, we saw an early example of this speculative fervor with Steve Wozniak's launch of a blockchain-based token sale of an energy-saving platform called F-Force. It received an initial valuation of $80 million and apparently rose 1,400% throughout the week and in the last 48 hours has shot up from there. The website looks very fancy, but if you take time to read the white paper, it starts to look like there isn't a lot of there there. So this represents to me an early stage of a green bubble. And now we can say at our chain that not only can we act with our heart in regards to working towards climate change solutions, we're on the right side of where a lot of the money is about to be poured in the coming years. So yeah, that's kind of, I think, you know, what for me happened this week uh, kind of represents um, you know, a, a kind of canary on the coal mine or, you know, a, a kind of a, an indicator that um, that uh, when, you know, BlackRock pledged that they were going to um, pour a lot of energy into sustainable solutions uh, in their portfolios and in their investment portfolios, because they saw that that's where the money's going. And when Goldman Sachs lists Exxon as a sell, all this has all happened in 2020. Uh, we're seeing a shift happening and we're seeing the fourth industrial revolution aligning with this shift. So I think Thomas Stalker is, is spot on with his assessment. Um, you know, there's all these brave new technologies that people are, 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 are crowing about saying we're on this kind of new renaissance, this new phase shift. Um, you know, once these technologies in the next 10 to 20 years start rolling in, we're going to be seeing this, you know, bold new future. Um, and I think that uh, the, the economic driving force for many of these technologies will be uh, the decarbonization economic boom. So that's, that's my thoughts. Thank you so much for that. I just wanted to add one thing that I remember learning um, a few years ago, I was studying different companies and why certain ideas catch or why, you know, just basically why big ideas succeed. And one major component of a study of a lot of different, um, not just companies, but successful people was the existence of the tailwinds, which is basically the, I don't know what tailwinds are in real life. I think it has something to do with air that helps you fly but i'm not sure what they are in this context is basically pre-existing factors that are happening in the world could be culturally could be could be politically could be financially that basically set the stage for what you're trying to do and i think that's one thing that you just basically described is the this positive tailwinds yeah. Happening. Well, I think, you know, when, when BlackRock makes these assessments and, you know, they're, they're in the business of generating income, um, they, uh, they look at all these different kind of um, various forces and, and many of it can be governmental. So this is where I think there's a connection between um, countries like New Zealand stating these, you know, climate states of emergency because um, that, that signals that these governments are going to start pouring money into these, these solutions. And then BlackRock goes, oh, I'm going to take notice. So, uh, you know, this is all interconnected, right? But we, we're starting to see the private sector, the public sector, um, and, uh, you know, other uh, new, new economies and technologies, um, uh, um, uh, you know, all, all rearing their heads towards the same thing 
Um, meanwhile, you know, it's pretty obvious, like your first first article you wrote that you presented today. Um, we're going to start to see more of, of these disasters. It's 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 clear it, statistically that these these disasters are exponentially rising in in number and in intensity. Um, this is going to have a profound. It can it, you know it already is, but it's going to have a more of a profound effect on public sentiment, and more people are going to demand answers and solutions. And the private and public sector are uh, going to. Uh, uh, rise to the occasion. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely 2020 has been a very transformative year in some good ways, and some bad ways, but I think it's definitely a turning point year that people will look back on and, and really say how things um, maybe they didn't change all at once, but definitely some light bulbs went off around the world, I think. Um, Steve, was there an article that you wanted to share? We have about 12 minutes left. No, I don't have an article with me today. Thank you, Steve. I was actually talking to Steve Ross Talbot. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, I don't have one either. Oh, really? Okay, no, that's fine. That I thought that Daryl said you might have one in the beginning. No, no, that was just fine. the passport. That was just about the eco passport and oh, the realization, right. and then, and then the realization when were you talking about the um, the first article that it is COVID yes. meets climate change, and that actually isn't it weird that we're now looking at well, we're looking at the COVID passport. Now, maybe we can think about looking at an eco passport. And it's kind of like Kate naturally from the article that you, that you first introduced. Absolutely. Yes, that's yes. Um, yeah, I don't know if I ever told you, but I remember that I read somewhere. Somebody said COVID is Mother Nature sending us all to our rooms so we can think about what we've done. Yeah, that's Gaia definitely reminded me of that um sorry daryl was there anything else that you wanted to add to your um to your discussion i want to thank you you seem to always write something very eloquent and i always appreciate that no thank you yes. um well uh, the one thing that kind of popped into my head while while you guys were talking earlier was about this cool whole, whole idea of um of the concept of the sharing economy as they call it. Um, uh, I think it's kind of like uh, funny how it is the sharing economy concept was virtually instantly co-opted by silos who are not into sharing at all. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting how this is the beginning of a movement, right? Like I see this as the first burst. So you, you're talking about eBay, Uber, Airbnb, um, uh, in Canada, we have this thing called skip the dishes, which is like Uber. Um, or it's kind of like, it's like Uber Eats, I should say. Um, and so, so, you know, we have these kind of like companies that are popping up, these startups, where uh, what's resulted in this is actually kind of a race to the bottom. Because you have, you know, Uber drivers who also have a day job, um, who are like struggling to feed a family and they have to work 18 hours a day because, um, you know, they're barely aching, making ends meet. Or you have, you know, uh, people who own a house or a property and to make a little bit of side money, they they put it up on Airbnb. So it's not really an economy that like is actually helping these people earn a, a proper living. Um, but it's the first step in what I think is going to break wide open. And we're going to start to see people uh, who come up with, with, with startups that have a bit of a different kind of business model that isn't necessarily about... Um, sending all of the profits to a silo um and and i and personally i believe it's going to come from the music industry first and then we'll see the idea and the pattern replicated and, and repeated so that people who do drive their cars to 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 become like their own personal taxi service actually make the bulk of the money not air not uber um so yeah this is that was just kind of another thought that i had and i think it ties into the fourth industrial revolution yeah, yeah. I kind of look at it as um, 
uh, you know, if you look at the the, 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 the the way that capitalism has has worked, you know, particularly as we've gone through the digital revolution and given rise to things like Facebook and Google and, and the like, and Uber and all of these, it, is that um, it's there's kind of there's a, that in capitalism there is this economic gravity that results in companies getting bigger and and they're becoming ever more acquisitive and get even bigger, right? And, and it actually stymies um, real uh, innovation um, because it's not really in their interest to innovate that much, just enough to keep people engaged. Um, and, and what the digital age has also done is wake, woken us all up um, across the planet to the fact that there are markets that you can engage in in different ways and you don't need necessarily um, uh, to belong to um, a, a company, so you can be a freelancer, an Uber driver. So there's this, they, they, what they've done is, is tell people that what you get is freedom, but you don't get much money, right? So you're paying for your freedom in a sense because of the, the loss that you, you, that you suffered because you're not working for a big taxi driving outfit. What, what, what happens when the sharing economy collides with a global scale blockchain? Um, is the empowerment of the individual. So all of the functions that an Uber would have given taxi drivers at the beginning, right, right at their beginning, all of those functions, which are largely accounting, right, and, and connecting driver with um, passenger, that's it, really, it's all they do. Right. Um, those could be part of the blockchain. And if they're part of the blockchain, then the collaborative of the taxi drivers that run it now are working and operating what is a truly decentralized market with a truly sharing economy. Exactly. And to me, this connects with the kind of the grand argument between, um, you know, Marxism and capitalism um, always kind of uh, is, is carried on in the arena of jobs, you know, of workers versus the company. Um, uh, and 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 I think that uh, that you know maybe you will, we can call it uh, capitalism 2.0 or it know, is it is it, it is capitalism but like the 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 kind of uh, next thing that will happen will will actually um, uh, 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 be an extension of the grand experiment of capitalism which was supposed to be about individual empowerment remember <laughs> um, we can re we can we can t we can kind of expand the idea of capitalism as it's as it's become now uh, back to the idea of inv individual empowerment where everybody owns their own company everybody we're yeah, not workers but, anymore we we own our own shit yeah i mean it, it, when capitalism was born it wasn't born into a world that was devoid of gravitational pull Right. It was born in, not into a, a world that was homogeneous uh, at all. It was quite heterogeneous and there were land barons and stuff like that. So it's not surprising it ends up um, just being a refinement on those days yeah, with the illusion of freedom given. So yeah. in a sense, what our chain can do is our chain is the anti-gravity for capitalism, giving rise to capitalism 2.0. I love it. I, I do like the capitalism 2.0 play. I must well, say, me, I think that's a, I yeah. think that's a really good way of doing it because people get really nervous if you don't mention it, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I think it's a healthier term. Um, yeah, I than, think it is. Than post-capitalism, um, because the it's like saying capitalism's wrong, isn't it? I and mean, nobody wants yeah. to be told they're all wrong. So when you say 2.0, uh, it's just like, hey, it's an improvement. It, uh, yeah, it, the, the original um, R-Chain white paper that I wrote was actually entitled E Pluribus Unum 2.0. Um, so, and, and there it's, it's how can, how can um, we be one of many and how can we make one out of many in a new way? Because that's really what um, self-organization is all about. That's fascinating. I feel like that would be a great topic for an article that only you could write, Greg, like so many <laughs> things. So one last thing, given we're near mm -hmm. the end of time. Um, so I contacted my, um, uh, my, my eco guy, Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion guy in Norway, and um, invited him uh, to come and do a climate call 
with us and to you know tell us you know what, what's a typical day or week like when you're doing all your activism stuff and you know what are the challenges you've got coordinating things and and just sort of having a chat with him as we do um and he said yeah any time in january any time in january whichever friday it falls he'd love to to come all right well how about the first friday in january that that it falls i shall check that and then i shall ping him back and line him up awesome very good awesome well thank you all so much if there aren't any final thoughts i just wanted to say thank you um for being uh part of this discussion today and um if anybody is interested who's listening you can um subscribe to our chain uh on uh youtube you can follow us on social media you can become a member of our chain at rchain.coop and if you um or if you want to be a guest or you know someone who'd like to be a guest uh please email us at climate at rchain.coop thank you everyone thank you thank you have a good weekend have a good weekend and stay safe you too bye